Well, welcome to our second chapel here at Camp Tikva. I wanted you to see this background particularly. Do you see the Bible is open and there's children walking out of the Bible? And if you look at it carefully, you can see certain Bible characters. You can see David and you can see Joseph in his coat of many colors. And you can see Daniel with sort of his royal outfit. And Mephibosheth there, he's crippled. The reason I'm showing you this background is because I want you to know that these stories are true, that the people in these stories were real people. They're not a once upon a time in a faraway place. Um, these, these are real people and these stories are true. And it's important that you know that because especially today, we're going to do the story of Noah. And I want you to know that Noah was a real person and that he, he lived in, and the story of the flood is a true story. I'm going to show you a chart here, and you might think that this chart is boring, but actually this chart's not boring. I find it a very interesting chart. Daniel, why don't you show us Adam up there at the top? Okay. And he was the very first person, and he lived 930 years. All right. That's a long time. But I want you to know that he's the first one, and then it has his son, we're using Seth. This is the royal line of Christ. And his son Seth, the one who was born after Abel was murdered, is Seth. And, and they each lived a long time. And we go on down until we find... Why don't you show us Enoch that we ended up with this morning? Okay, he would be the great-great-great-grandson or something of uh, Adam. And did you notice that Adam's still alive... Maybe you could show that. Adam's still alive when Enoch was taken to heaven alive. And that's where we left off this morning. Enoch had a son named Methuselah. And Methuselah had an interesting name. When he was born, Enoch named him, When he dies, it will come. And so... Show the line for the flood, Daniel. The line, okay. Can you see that Methuselah died the same year? Can you point that out? To make sure they see that Methuselah dies the same year as the flood, and so his name was true. When it come, he will die when it comes. Just Methuselah died, and then the flood came. His son Lamech didn't quite live to the flood. Maybe you can see that there. And Noah, of course, lived on both sides of the flood, and. Well, I guess I'll show you while it's up here. Do you notice the lives get shorter as it goes all the way down to Joseph? Maybe you could show how the lives are all shorter there going on down. So we're going to introduce you right now to Methuselah and Lamech and Noah. That's Noah, and Lamech is in the green, and Methuselah is there, the older gentleman, on the left. And the... Uh, Noah got married. We're going to take the other two gentlemen off. And Noah got married, and he and his wife had three children, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And you can see there's uh, a little boy in blue and one in white, and the baby's in sort of a swing there. And so he had these three children. I want to tell you what life was like when Noah was here. There was a lot of violence in the world. People were beating each other up, and there were wars. People were being killed. There were riots. It was um, uh, lots and lots and lots of violence in the earth. And God didn't want that. And in, in a way, it reminds us of today with lots of violence in the world. And so God said, I'm going to bring judgment on the world. And I'm going to bring judgment by having destroying the earth with water. And so God told Noah. Now, Noah was different. He wasn't one of these violent people. He and his wife loved God and worshipped God. So God said, I'm going to start over. We started the first time with Adam and Eve. He's going to start over again here with one family, with Noah and his wife and the three children. 
And he said, Noah, I want you to build a boat. Now, I want you to look there. Do you see any water in that picture? You don't see any water in there. He's going to build a boat out in the desert. And so he asks his children to help him. And so there's Noah, and he's cutting some wood for it. And there are his children, and they're working. And they take wood, and they're going to uh, start building a boat out in the middle of the desert. And uh, Julie's going to show you here the boat as it starts to uh, get. He took him, oh, over 100 years to, uh, to build this boat. It took a long time. They didn't have any power tools and uh, not a lot of people to help. But they're, uh, they're building this, this boat. The whole family's working on it. It doesn't say it in Genesis, but Noah gathered some of the people. Well, people probably came. They thought, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen, building a boat in the middle of a desert. And they came, and Noah used the opportunity to tell them that there's going to be judgment from God. And there was no way for them to... There was no way for them to escape the judgment except being on the boat. When the water came, the only way to be saved was to get on the boat. And they're laughing. Can you see them? It doesn't say that they laughed, but obviously they laughed because they never asked to go on the boat. And they thought that Noah, I think, was a little crazy building a boat here in this desert. And so it said even though Noah was a preacher, he didn't seem to get anybody who was uh, interested in doing that. Well, the boat, the ark gets finished. And I want you to notice this ark. It doesn't look like a great ship that you'd see in the world today. The ships in the world today are pointed on the ends because they want to go through the water. They're moving. And the sides uh, or smooth, like you'd go through the water. This just looks like a great big box. Can you see that? And so that it was to be stable so that in the storms that were going to come, it wouldn't go over. And you can see the ramp there. That's how they got in and out of the boat. Well, the family had to prepare food. They were going to be in the ark for over a year. And it's hard to buy think about food for a family for over a year, but they had a lot more food they needed to take. They had to take food for animals to go into. So we're going to take the food and they're going to store it in the ark. And then it's interesting about the animals. Noah didn't have to go out and capture the animals. God brought the animals to the ark. I find that very interesting that God was able to bring them. Now, Julie just put up a dinosaur. You want to point that out to them? There, you see the dinosaur? You say, well, dinosaurs didn't go on the boat. I don't believe that the dinosaurs disappeared until after this. He may have taken very, very, he would say, well, there wouldn't be enough room for dinosaurs on the boat. Well, he may have taken very, very young dinosaurs on the boat, but he he was able, he took all these, and God brought them. God brought all these animals to the ark. And they all went in the ark. And they were there for, they all were getting settled. Noah had it all fixed up for them. And finally, God said, all right, I want the family to go into the ark. And so the... Um, the family did. Uh, there's the three sons. Uh, there's the three wives. And Mrs. No Mrs. Noah's right in front there. And Noah's in the back. And they're going to go up that ramp. And go, yeah, they're going to go into the ark. Now, that ramp is interesting. It's probably the door. When they all got in the ark, I want you to notice this. God shut the door. God probably lifted up that ramp and shut the the door. Now, the door is shut. If anybody wants to get in, they can't get in. It's, it's like this. I want you to understand that the only way to get out of the judgments that's coming is to get on the boat. But at some point, God shuts the door. And it, when God brings judgment at the end of the earth, it's going to be too late people will find that the door is shut and they can't get into heaven. We need to accept Christ now. 
so the um, they're in there about a week, and then the rain comes, and the, you, uh, Julie's going to show you the sky. We have thunder and lightning, and and you can see the blue streaks there in the uh, gray sky. The the rain comes. Then there were more things that happened. There were volcanoes that went off. There, uh, Daniel's tape. Uh, the um, you can see that the um, uh, Daniel put a volcano up on the right, and then we're going to find. Now look what Julie put up. That is water coming up out of the ground. It's shooting up out of the ground. There's water underneath the, the, the Earth's surface, and that water came up. I want you to understand that raining for 40 days would not cover the Earth the same, not yet, as the, um, the, it wouldn't cover the Earth as much as this. There had to be more water than this. Well, some of the water came in that these geysers that Julie had that she just put up, there were a lot of those. A lot of water came up from below the surface. Also, do you remember back at the beginning when God, about the second day, God separated the water in the sky from the water on the earth. And so we believe that there was like a canopy of water, like a, a layer of water up in the sky, above what we see in the sky. And that water collapsed. Maybe the heat from the volcanoes did it. I'm not sure what did it, but that water collapsed and it all went on the earth. It would take a lot of water to make the water higher than the highest mountain. And so here they are, all this water is coming and they're safe in the boat and the water starts rising on the ground and there's the people start thinking, oh my, I'm wondering if uh, Noah was correct. And they come and they say, oh my, uh, I wonder if we knock on the door, if, if Noah will let us in. Well, Noah can't, God shut the door and they can't go in and look, they're praying and they're scared and it's, it's a difficult time for them. Well, the rain keeps, the water keeps rising, and all the people who are on the earth, except for Noah's family, die. And we're gonna show the ark here floating on the water because the water's become so deep that the water's covering the whole world. Now, I want you to notice this. We're gonna put the ark on here. Do you see how turbulent that is turbulent means that there's big waves and the, the boat is going up and down and up and down. Um, what's happening here that the land is changing. Some of the land is going up and some of the land is going down. There weren't many oceans before. There, were, there was a smaller amount of water and more land well, now the bottoms of the ocean's going to go down and, uh, and there's, there's turbulence. There's, there's, everything's going up and down and up and down. And finally, the, the water gets calm. And Daniel's going to show you here uh, the water being calm. And the, the boat gets to uh, ride in it a little better. Now, God sends some wind. And he's going to try to evaporate some of that water. Most of the water, though, didn't go by evaporation. It would go by um, going down into making the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. You can see that the water is receding, and the boat has landed on the top of a mountain. And Julie's going to show you the water going down more. And we get, there we go. Can you see? The water's going down more and more, and the boat is, come, is sitting there on the mountain. Well, we're going to take the wind away, and Noah, uh, there's a window there, Julie, in front of you, and if you open that window, you can see Noah standing there. And Noah thinks, I wonder if there's a place where there's dry ground. And so he sends out a raven. And we're going to have the raven fly around, flit around in the sky. There we go. 
And the, why don't we have the raven flit off? The raven doesn't come back. He flits around in the sky. Okay. Uh, and he doesn't come back. And you say, well, where did the raven stop? Because I don't see any land in that picture. I'll tell you where I think the raven stopped. I think there were a lot of dead animals floating around on the top of the water because there were a lot of animals that were killed. And ravens like to eat dead animals. And they may have landed on a dead animal. He landed on something and was happy. Well, then Noah decided he'd send out a dove. And the dove went out, and the dove looked all around and couldn't find anybody. Now, doves don't like to land on dead animals. They're, they're a nice, clean animal. And couldn't find any place, and the dove came back to Noah. Noah put out his hand and brought the dove. He flew backwards, okay? And uh, the... Uh, <laughs> Noah brought him back in. We waited a week, and he sent out the dove again. And this time the dove came back with an olive branch. And his, there we go. Can you see the olive branch? And he came, But he came back to Noah. So some tree's growing somewhere. An olive tree's growing somewhere. Noah's encouraged that things are going to get better and better. And finally he sent the dove out. And the dove didn't come back. It just flew around. And never came back. That meant that there was land and a place for the dove. And Noah's quite happy. Well, they do we have the, the bird? The, there we go. There the and have it fly far away. And Noah doesn't see him again. There we go. And so finally, the water recedes enough. We're going to show you the to Mount Ararat. These are mountains there. They're in what's called Turkey today. The ark finally lands on Mount Ararat. And God speaks to him and says that it's time when it's all dry there for them to come out. The people, the family comes out first and they come down and then the animals come out. And the animals all find a place that they're happy with and they all scatter. And you notice there's two of each of them. And so they have young animals. God's saving all the different kinds of animals that are on the earth this way. Well, you think... But what would Adam do, what would Noah do first? What would Noah do first? Well, the first thing Noah did was to thank God. His family is the only family left. Yeah, those are the animals coming down the hill, down from the ark. Noah wondered what he'd do first. Well, the first thing he did, he wanted to thank God. God. He wanted to thank God that he and his family are safe. So we're going to have the animals all go off to wherever they went and the uh, they were able to have more animals because there were two of them. And But Noah built an altar. And he had enough animals. There were more than two sheep. There were uh, seven, probably seven pairs of sheep. So he had a lot of sheep that he could sacrifice and have an altar to thank God that they were saved. That's something that uh, we thank God because we're saved from, by Christ and he's thanking God because he was saved from the flood. And they're the only people there left on the earth, but they want to worship God and thank God. And God's telling them some new rules, too. Before, they never ate meat. So we're going to take the altar off, and the family's going to have some meat to eat. This is the very first time. Here they are sitting around. They're eating. Pull it down. And the, there's the uh, one brother, and he's bringing some more meat to the table. So this was something new. The, uh, the family was eating meat there. And then Noah had to plant uh, a farm place. He had to plant vineyards, and he had to uh, plant all sorts of uh, vegetables, and uh, he planted uh, fruit trees, and he the, the, he had to support the family. This All those other things have been killed. All right, here's Noah's family, and you can see that they had to work hard to raise food after the whole world had been changed. And the his children had many children. There were lots and lots and lots of grandchildren. And so I just wanted you to uh, see, oh, I thought there were more grandchildren. Well, there were lots of grandchildren. Here we go. And so now this is the population of the world that's growing. I wanted you to notice that there was Ham, Shem, and Japheth. 
we're going to talk about the royal line of Christ, the, um, the Christ came through Shem. I wanted to tell you something else. Noah took a lot of things on the ark. He took animals and he took food and he took his family on the ark, but he took something else when he got on the ark because Adam had started writing the Bible and talking about creation and different ones along the way would add to it and that is the Bible that we read and Noah took that on the ark that was preserved when we had the flood and God came to Noah when they're there and he said I'm going to give you a way of knowing that I'm making a covenant I'm making a promise with you God made a promise that there would never be a, a worldwide flood. And he gave them a symbol for it. He said, I'm going to put a rainbow in the sky. And when you see this rainbow, you will remember that I'm not going to cover the whole world with a flood ever again. I'm not going to judge the world in this way again. But I want you to understand that in the future, there's going to be a worldwide judgment again, but this time, the next time it will not be by a flood. He promised Noah that. I want, I want to show you something about this ark. This ark was the only way to be saved from the flood. And I'm going to show you a picture of a boy here. See, I want you to really understand this. This boy is out, he was probably in a boat. And he was out in a, well, he's in the, yeah, like that. He was out in a boat and he fell out of the boat or the boat got a leak and it sank. Something happened. This boy does not know how to swim. Look at that. He's going down. And he's scared to death. Somebody comes along and throws him a life ring. Now, he has a choice. He has a choice. He can say, no, I think I'd rather drown. Uh, I'd like to do it all by myself. I don't want to have you help me. I, I don't want the life ring. And Daniel's going to show you what's going to happen to the boy. Oh, my. Oh, my. What happened to the boy? He said, I don't want the life ring. And he drowned. That was his choice. Or he could say, yeah, wonderful. There's a uh, life ring. Thank you. Thank you. And he grabs hold of the life ring. And now he can float on into shore. And he's going to live. And so I want you to see what's on the life ring. It says, Jesus, our lifesaver. It's like being asked if you want to accept Jesus. And you say, no, I like living my own life. I want to see my own happiness. I want to do things my way. I don't think so. Well, the end of that is death, eternal death. But he's saying, no, I want Jesus. And then he can go on into shore and live. I'm going to show you another picture. This picture is a boy. He has a choice too. Jesus says, I love you. I want you to be my child forever. I died for you. Will you take me as your savior? Will you live your life for me? Will you always try to please me? And look what this boy is doing. What's he saying? He's saying, yes, yes, I want you to be my savior. I, I want to belong to you. I want to be happy. I want to please you and live with you forever. And so I just want you to understand even the story of Noah's Ark tells us that we have a choice. And God lets us have it. If we want to say, no, I don't want Christ, that God says, all right, that you have a choice. I didn't force you to believe in me. And so I wanted you to see this wonderful part of the story. Well, the story goes on. I want you to see uh, here... Mount Ararat. I want Daniel to point out Mount Ararat. That's where the ark landed. And when the family got off, can you see the Tigris and Euphrates rivers there? And between them, can you see it's green instead of brown? That's where Noah went to live because you could grow plants there. It wasn't deserty. It was um, fertile. You could have nice farms there. Well, there was a man who grew up there, and his name was Nimrod. And he was descended from Noah's son, Ham. And Daniel's going to show you the chart about when Nimrod lived. He lived when Eber was alive, 
And so he's going to show you when he broke. Okay, show when Noah was so they can kind of get the feeling. And Noah is still alive when Nimrod comes. Can you see that? Because he lived during the time of Eber. Noah's, Noah's still alive. But Nimrod decided he, that he wanted to be the most important person in the world. So he went up to Nineveh. There's Nineveh. And he built a city. And he went to Babylon. And he built a city. And he thought, ah, this is wonderful. And we have a picture of him on the roof of his palace in Babylon. And he says, ah, oh, this is mine. This is all mine. Uh, this is, uh, I'm the ruler of all this. And he's standing on the roof. There he is. He says, this is mine, all mine. Everything out here is mine. Can you see these buildings that he has that are sort of, uh, looks a little bit like pyramids? Uh, there's one right behind him. Daniel, can you point that out? It has about four layers. No, right behind him. No, right there. Okay. Can you see each layer is higher than the layer before? Those were called ziggurats. Those were... Um, pagan things. You can see he had steps going on the left hand side of him as we look at him. And you can walk through those arches and go keep going. Okay, this was all there for worship of pagan gods. And so he thought, I know what I'll do. I'm going to build a tower that's bigger than this. And all the world is going to worship one god. You can see Nimrod's here and he's exclaiming. He, he, there we go. And he's saying, I'm going to build a tower and it's going to go all the way up to the sky and all the people are going to worship. We're going to have one world religion. Everybody's going to have the same religion and I'm going to be the man who is the, the leader of all of this. And he says, let's get started building this tower. And so here we go. We're going to start building this tower out in the desert. And you can see they've got pretty much done the top, uh, pretty much done on this tower. There we go. The people are all building. It's called the Tower of Babel. And you'll see why it got its name. And the people are all working and they're all working together. And you can see all those people that are uh, cooperating and bringing stones and building on it. And God, yeah, God says, let us go down. You can see all these people working and God says, let us go down and let us see what's happening. And you say, well, who is us? Well, us is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God didn't need to come down. He knew what was happening, but I think it's an expression to show that he wanted to know what was going on, and he came and he thought, if I let this go on, all the world will be one language, one country, one religion, one leader, and if that one leader is evil, then the whole world will, will be evil. And he thought, I've got to separate this so there will be different nations. And so you, can, you won't have one person that would be uh, doing evil for the whole world. So God said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to change their languages. So these people are going to speak a whole lot of different languages. So if someone says, hand me a hammer, all of a sudden he's speaking another language and the other person had no idea what he was saying. And if they said, hand me a brick, they didn't know what he was saying. It was a different language. And they all gave up. They all said, we can't build this ark. We don't understand. It's called the Tower of Babel because Babel means like you're babbling and not saying anything that sounds like anything anyone could understand. And look at them. They're leaving. They're saying, we, we give up on this. We're, we're going away. Well, they all went different directions. And they all started different countries. And I wanted to show you that this story is important. And it's important because it could help you understand what's happening in the world today. In the world today, there, there's going to be a man who's going to rise up. And he's going to say, I have the answer to all the problems in the world. I have the answer to the economy. There, Julie put this man up. And he could be, he could actually be in the world today. But um, 
he could rise up and say, I know the answer to poverty. I can make it so nobody's poor. I can make it so nobody's hungry. I can make it so that nobody is uh, fighting, um, that the uh, ecology is good. Nobody's uh, throwing trash in the oceans to hurt the animals. I can make it so everything's perfect. There's no wars. There's just peace. It's just all going to be wonderful. If you elect me, well, instead of having individual countries, we'll just have one world government and one world where we'll kind of pick out a religion, but I'm going to be the leader of that religion. And if you'd all worship me, well, everything will be fine. This man is evil. This man is called the Antichrist. He's against Christ. And he's rising up at the end to pull people away from God so they wouldn't believe in God. They believe in this one world religion that he is offering. And so you need to keep your eyes and ears open to know these things so that you won't be trapped into following him when he comes. Nimrod was somebody who lived so God would kind of show us what this man would be like and that he would be evil and we would not want to follow him. And he's going to be coming it just before God brings judgment or at the beginning of judgment on the world because of our sin. I wanted to show you something else here. When, when I went to school, we talked about cavemen. We uh, drew the pictures that the cavemen had on the walls. And when I read the Bible, I thought, I didn't see any cavemen in there. Adam wasn't a caveman. His son built a city. Uh, they were very, Adam came knowing language, and uh, Adam could write. He could wrote some at the beginning of the Bible. Uh, these weren't cavemen, and yet the Bible, uh, there, are, there were cavemen. We have their drawings, and we know about it. Well, possibly... When they all left quickly, they had to find somewhere to live. And until they built their houses, they may have lived in caves. Or even later during the Ice Age, perhaps they lived in caves. But we're, we're talking, not talking about Adam and Eve being cave people. They were very, very intelligent people. I, I wanted you to notice that with this Tower of Babel, people wanted to get to God by themselves. They were building this tower so they could get to God. Well, we don't get to God by ourselves. Only We only get to, the, to, to God by Christ. He only provided one way, and there is only one way. And I pray that each one of you kids would ask Christ to be your Savior while you're at Camp Tikva, if you've not already done it. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for Noah and his obedience to you and his making the ark, the ark which was the only way to be saved. We thank you for showing us about the Antichrist so we can be wise and not follow his falseness and that we would turn to you. We'd be like the boy who was standing there facing Christ and said, I love you, I want to follow you, I want to obey you, I want to please you with my whole life and be your child. I pray that each one of us would make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.